good afternoon evening professor beard uh, thanks for having my, me <laughs> it is my honor and pleasure to uh, have our audience experience you yet another time but before we dive into anything uh, what uh, would be a good disclaimer uh, the following is for discussion purposes and entertainment only none of this is investment advice whenever you're working with your own portfolio you should consult your your own uh, financial uh, financial advisor, psychic, uh, etc. Before you uh, do any, anything anything with real money. Yeah, uh, and psychics are important, but legal advisors, tax advisors, all the advices you could possibly have. <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. Uh, what do we have today? Well, inspired by your your recent picks um, in uh, in the uh, in the lovely country of of Turkey. Uh, in particular, the uh, as you as you were as you were showing the uh, Coca Cola bottler and uh, Tav, the airport operator, I I wanted to bring the uh, the corresponding equivalents that I'm more familiar with from the uh, Mexico Mexico and Latin America region. So there's a, a, a bottler and an airport operator uh, that I that I wanted to to kind of chat about. So in in no particular order, since you're since you've already got your your can open. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll tackle the bottler here. Um, so the, the bottler is, is a name that, um, you know, those in the region would, would certainly be familiar with. Uh, it's, it's called FEMSA and similar to the pick that you had, uh, of CCI for, for Turkey, they also have an interesting corporate structure. Um, so let me just, uh, share this. So the parent company of, of Coca-Cola FEMSA, which is the which is the bottler specific uh, portion, the parent company is is FEMSA, uh, and both FEMSA and FEMSA Coca-Cola uh, trade as ADRs on uh, on the New York Stock Exchange, which is nice. So there's no no um, no complicated purchasing for, for these particular these particular tickers. So FMX, this is the this is the parent company. They own uh, the Coca-Cola bottler. They own uh, they used to own uh, one of the original breweries in northern Mexico, Cerveceria Cuauhtémoc, uh, which was sold to AB InBev, and they retained a portion of that investment. Uh, so similar to a lot of the conglomerates that we've we've looked at, they uh, they've retained some uh, some ownership in the in the in the in the now parent company of their former brewery, um, which leads to some interesting valuation here. Um, and they also own uh, some distribution in the in the region. Most notably, for anybody who's ever been to Mexico, they own the uh, OXO uh, convenience stores, which are which are ubiquitous uh, in Mexico, both in you know big cities as well as tourist area areas. I mean, you you can you can you can literally throw a stone in, in almost any city in Mexico, and and uh, the, the the rock will roll down the street and end up at the at the front door of an OXO. Um, they do gas, food. Uh, snacks, some some grocery there. Um, they're sort of your your one stop shop for um, for for a lot of food and beverage. And so they, they also own they also own that. And then as a conglomerate, there's also a few other you know various other businesses. Um, uh, quickly touch on the PEs, please. Sure. Yeah. So the PE for this business uh, looks pretty high uh, on a on a trailing basis, but if you look. If you look at more uh, more context from a historical perspective or from a forward PE basis, it's not uh, it, it's not as bad. Um, the the Coca Cola bottler that we're going to look at more specifically, I think I uh, uh, has a has a much better price of sales. So I, I mean, I think in terms of which one is the is the more uh, more interesting uh, more interesting valuation, it's probably the, the bottler. So I can I'll switch to that one here um, in a second. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of the conglomerate, they do about uh, about about uh, about eight hundred uh, billion uh, Mexican uh, pesos annually. That's about thirty three billion USD, uh, 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 roughly. Um, so this is a pretty pretty massive pretty massive business. Uh, not a huge dividend, little little on the expensive side, um, but interesting as the as the parent company of the of the bottler that I wanted to. Uh, focus on today. So, the the actual portion of the business that is the bottler, the the uh, the licensee for 
Coca-Cola in the region is uh, Coca-Cola FEMSA. Also has an ADR, KOF. They pay a, 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 um, a nice hefty dividend. Uh, it's still, even just when you're looking at only the bottler portion of this business, it's still pretty massive. Uh, 242 uh, uh, billion Mexican pesos a year. This this business is, is roughly 15 billion uh, annually uh, in US dollars. Um, and the PE on this one uh, is, uh, is, is roughly equivalent, but uh, I would draw your attention to price to sales on this one uh, as, as on a price to sales basis, as well as on a dividend basis, as well as on a, uh, um, on sort of more of the, the core growth of the business. I, I would, I would, I would submit the, the bottler portion is more interesting. Um, so let me, let me pull up one other, uh, little, Piece of content here. There's knights on this one. Uh, they've got a they've got a nice little map here of their of their regional presence. So, uh, well over fifty percent, uh, somewhere in the fifty five to sixty percent range of their of their revenue comes from Mexico, um, but they do have a significant presence in Brazil uh, and Colombia, and then in a few other locations in South America, but also in Central America, they they do. Um, they do some uh, distribution as well as some, uh, as well as as well as some um, some bottling uh, activity, uh, as well. And then the other the other quick, cool chart they had. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, quick question on that. So, are they the favored bottler uh, in the region? W what I mean by that is, uh, is there competition among bottlers, or is there a fair and easy chance for this bottler to? Uh, encroach the remainder of the LATAM markets. Yeah, there, there are there are some other large distributors in the region. In terms of in terms of Mexico, th this is by by far and away the the largest player. Um, but you know, Pepsi and their affiliates uh, do exist, uh, and then there are some um, you know some small some smaller some smaller brands as well. And then outside of Mexico, um, they're not a huge presence. So if you look at this one, you can see where, where, most, where most of their transaction and unit volume is. So they're 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 huge in Mexico. Uh, they have a, a reasonable presence in Brazil and Colombia, but they're by no means the the number one players there. And then there are you know quite a few other uh, countries in Latin America where they have either no presence or very limited presence. They have a respectable presence in Central America, but but they're not the only one there. But when in terms meant, of sorry, when I meant competition, I meant intra Coca Cola supplier bottler competition, uh, as opposed to inter bottler competition. Sure. Like, is they, are they a favored bottler with yes, Coca? Yeah. Like, how is their relationship with the parent in Atlanta? That's right. Yeah. So at least in terms of Mexico, they're the only Coca Cola bottler. Um, for the rest of Latin America, I I don't believe that is the the case. Um, but at least for Mexico, they are the they're the exclusive Coca-Cola bottler uh, and distributor, um, so they're they don't really have any any competition from from other Coca-Cola, you know, bottler or suppliers. And in in Mexico, they're they're fairly vertically integrated, so they they own uh, they own the company in in Monterey that actually makes the glass uh, uh, and the bottles for for their bottling facility. They own the the bottling facilities. Uh, they own the distribution for. Uh, the soda itself, and they also own, you know, you know, through the parent company, they also own the, you know, one of the largest uh, convenience store brands in Mexico. So, as far as the world of Coke is concerned, they they don't really have any competition in Mexico. Random fact, uh, but maybe you plan to cover it. Maybe you don't. Do you know what is common between the Coca Cola that's manufactured in Mexico and the Coca Cola that used to be manufactured in <laughs> India? I don't really know. Uh, what the case is now, but do you know why it's coveted even in regions like Canada when I go to the grocery store? Oh yeah, ab absolutely. So, and they still to this day, the FEMSA uh, in Mexico, when they bottle Coca Cola, they use cane sugar. Uh, <laughs> they they don't use sugar from sugar beets. Um, and in in fact, so uh, you know they're the largest bottler you know in Mexico. They're the they're the they're really the only Coca Cola player there. But they they have a, a unique. Uh, um, a unique competitive advantage tied to exactly what you're saying, which is 
normally they are not allowed to distribute uh, in the United States because the United States, it, you know, the, the, the regular KO parent company, Coca-Cola, uh, is responsible for the distribution there. However, Coca-Cola, because of the cane sugar piece, has allowed FEMSA to, to enter in some limited deals for distribution. So, for example, you can find uh, FEMSA bottled and manufactured Coca-Cola with cane sugar uh, in stores like Costco in the U.S. Nice. And and do they bottle anything that's uh, outside of this? Like CCI had wasn't exclusively a Coca-Cola bottler. They had the freedom to bottle whatever. Like Haritos. Oh, Harito. I, I hope I'm taking the name of the drink. Yeah, right. Haritos. I don't believe Haritos is one of their brands. Um, I, I'd have to check. But but they do have a number of other popular uh, soda, soda um, like, uh, like uh, Fanta is one of theirs. And they do a lot of uh, you know water and uh, other 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 things there. So it's not it's not just Coca Cola. There's some other popular brands. Haritos, I don't believe uh, I don't believe is one of them. Um, yeah. So that is that is FEMSA Coca Cola. Um, any other anything else you? Oh, right, let me just hop back to the. Yeah, maybe at some point, uh, either now or later, we could compare uh, how how the two bottlers pit against one another. If it's yes, any that's right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That was one thing I was going to mention. So, in terms of the last five and ten year uh, performance, so relative to Coca Cola, the the U.S. conglomerate uh, that they license the um, the soda from. Over the last five years, FEMSA Coca-Cola, uh, this the, the the Mexico company that we're talking about, has actually done better um, than Coca-Cola U.S. Um, over the last uh, ten years, uh, Coca-Cola you know U.S. Uh, wins in that in that matchup. Um, and then if you go back, to, if you go out to like 15, 20 years, uh, Coca-Cola, FEMSA Coca-Cola, Mexico is uh, is is again the is again the winner. So. A lot more volatility on FEMSA Coca-Cola. It, it's an ADR. There's some, you know, uh, foreign exchange pieces too, uh, and they've had different, um, you know, different ch challenges relative to Coca-Cola. But um, in the last five years, they've done better than Coca-Cola US, and in, in 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 like a 20, 25 year period, they've done better um, than Coca-Cola US uh, as well. Um, and right now, the the dividend is is pretty close. Uh, so. Uh, about three and a half percent for FEMSA Coca-Cola. I believe the U.S. one is in the three point two, yeah, three point two percent range. Um, so you know, it it's it certainly depends on uh, you know the time horizon you're looking at here. Um, but for 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 most of uh, for most of the the longer term history of this company, it's it you would have done better you would have done better owning FEMSA Coca-Cola than Coca-Cola U.S. Um, and even though their dividends have 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 gotten closer over time, the the FEMSA Coca Cola dividend is still uh, a bit higher. So, what do you think about FEMSA Coca Cola uh, based on the uh, the Turkish bottler you you had evaluated? Yeah, Any that's what I was asking. Uh, that's what I was asking. What happens if we add? If we can add that to the list, uh, let the numbers speak for oh. themselves. Is what is the um, what is the ticker on that one again? I just pause. Yeah, you're over five years. I think your Turkish one's done much better. Wow, look at that! I think your pick uh, wins on that one. <laughs> okay, well. I guess uh, the numbers speak for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the C the CCI bottler, the Turkish bottler, has done has done much better. Yeah. Uh, what other? The, was that all about Coca Cola? Or it... yeah, that's that's all I had for Coca Cola, and then I also have the 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 airport operator as well. All right. Let's look at the airports then. Um, so this one compares with uh, with uh, Tab, which was the Turkish operator that you. That you had looked at, and uh, similar to uh, similar to to the Turkish operator, they they derive most of their revenue from from airports, but they also have a number of of non uh, uh, 
non-aeronautical revenue streams, uh, similar to the to the Turkish uh, company that we looked at. A lot of it re revolves around food and beverage, um, airport management, duty-free shops, etc. Um, a ni nice thing about this company is, you know, respectable dividend. It's got price of sales and NPE very competitive. Has a long history in the region, and you know, lately it's been trading um, for for quite a discount um, relative to its its recent performance. Uh, and a lot of that is due to a change that the Mexican government uh, implemented in terms of what part of how much of the of their of their revenue gets kicked back to the government in in terms of uh, in terms of uh, you know royalty for being able to being able to be the op airport operator in those areas. Um, and there's still some kind of back and forth on that to see you know to see if it'll really impact their business. But there's been uh, in the last uh, six months, in particular, there's been some volatility volatility related to the uncertainty around how much that will impact their business. Uh, in terms of their core business, though, there's you know they, they're still seeing they're still seeing increases in passenger traffic year over year, month over month. Um, so the the post pandemic uh, revenge travel uh, trend is still in full swing in Mexico, especially in the winter time. A lot of people are traveling to Mexico for uh, both for tourism and for business, uh, as a result of a lot of the you know onshoring, nearshoring, uh, and increased industrial activity in, in Mexico as well. So, in terms of their core business, they're not seeing any slowdown. If anything, they're seeing you know even better growth rates than they had in the past. But there is some uncertainty uh, related to uh, what the government will charge. Um, On the revenge travel bit, I don't understand that emotion much. But uh, who's the <laughs> revenge against? Uh, <laughs> it's 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 revenge against the coronavirus, uh, oh. it's, and so the revenge travel is so named because you know people were kind of in lockdown and travel was hard or expensive or you know there were there were there were there were challenges in getting paperwork submitted to travel overseas and different countries had different rules and and so people kind of put off travel and so the revenge travel trend is a. Uh, is uh, people kind of uh, uh, because they they had foregone travel for a couple of years, uh, the you know they kind of like feel the need to really get back to the travel and and you know take revenge on the coronavirus for ruining their travel plans during the pandemic. Well, uh, based on their data, again, uh, this is all hearsay. I haven't looked at the numbers. Uh, when it comes to traveling, uh, uh, the revenge is doesn't seem to be working. Uh, based on based on how I understand the definition of the word. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. Um, and similar to the to the operator airport operator you looked at in, in Turkey, they have a, a a large network. I think uh, not quite as large as the operator that you had looked at, but they're 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 relatively diversified regionally within Mexico, and they also um, they also have two airports uh, in Jamaica uh, as, as well. So they they have a small. Um, footprint outside of, of Mexico, but a, a fairly broad, um, uh, a fairly broad presence within Mexico. Um, and you know, in in terms of, uh, let's see, did they have the? I'll probably that, that one's later. I think the the regulatory change I mentioned that's causing uh, the uncertainty here. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> I'm not going to go through this because I don't really understand it in detail. But this is this is the. Uh, this is the this is the change that has caused some of the uncertainty, um, and you know, based on the latest numbers that they released at the end of February, you know, their so far their revenue is you know unaffected. Um, they they don't believe it'll have uh, you know a huge long term impact, um, but the full impact on you know what they're going to pay with these with these new formulas is uh, difficult to forecast. Uh, and not entirely, um, not entirely uh, set in stone yet. There's still uh, there's still some chance that it can change. So that's that's why a lot of the that, that's why you can see the volatility in the stock left the last six months, um, and it's trading you know quite a quite a bit down from from where it had been uh, six months ago. That all that is fine. I uh, uh, I I know uh, this formula of NPV is taught in B schools and then. Buffett and Munger uh, uh, insist on unlearning that. So <laughs> let, let's let's forget this piece. Uh, what uh, I'm curious is have they uh, have they wined and dined with people they should be and is oh yeah 
Absolutely. How's the relationship between uh, the regulators and and the operator? Yeah, I, they 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 are certainly you know closely engaged with them. The the other piece that you know had caused some uncertainty was the uh, was the Mexico City airport was uh, the the management of that airport has had changed in the current administration, uh, and so the the military had taken over uh, running that airport for a while. Um, so. There were there were some concerns by investors that perhaps the the, the government of Mexico might um, uh, you know, interfere with other airports. I I that hasn't that hasn't happened, and uh, the current administration in Mexico that that put these changes in place, uh, their term expires this year, and and uh, AMLO is not eligible to run for another term. So uh, it's 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 likely that you know. The, the churn that caused all this uncertainty won't even be a factor in the future. Um, and even if it is, you know, they they have a pretty strong uh, history of growth. And, you know, if, if they lose a couple points of, of margin as a result, I don't think it would be uh, a problem. This, this is their, uh, this is their uh, aer aeronautical revenue and, and non-aeronautical revenue um, margin over time. And so you can see they have a long history of being a very, uh, very good uh, operator, uh, allocator of capital, um, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, and you know, a lot of growth in terms of in terms of the traffic through their um, through their airports. Geopolitically, outside of U.S., you seem to be much kinder to a certain region relative to others. I may guess why that might be, but uh, yeah. I'll just leave that with. I think, I think it's mostly familiarity. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think, I think in terms of, in terms of what what parts of the world I understand better. I think you know Mexico, given its proximity to the U.S. and and you know I you know I've I've been, I've been there many times and uh, and have you know extended family there. So you know I I think just the familiarity the familiarity helps and. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 one thing to read about a region uh, and companies that are in that region, but it's it's another thing to it's another thing to say. Uh, you know, have witnessed the in the uh, in the previous in the previous company's case, that witnessed the uh, how many OXO convenience stores there are. is It's one thing to see that, and it's one thing to use you know to use the airports and see the traffic. Um, you know, e even in the last. I don't know, 15 years, um, the the amount of times where there is a, a line at the airport or, you know, uh, more people or uh, airport expansions. I mean, like, e even over that 15 years, I've seen uh, just just even the the few times I go, just the the growth um, through through these regions. So, um, yeah, I think mostly it's mostly familiarity. Um, uh, no bias. Proximity and familiarity. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you, I don't know if you uh, knew about it, but similar to revenge travel, there's this, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends uh, in San Diego and Arizona, and mm. they say it's a lot cheaper to just drive across the border for those who have the luxury oh, of just walking across and coming back mm -hmm. to, to just yeah. go across the border from, say, Tucson, Arizona, or san diego california uh, go on the other side and and go to the tj airport or the nogales uh mm -hmm. region and then pick a flight it is at least three four hundred dollars cheaper on average per person per leg uh to fly yeah that and way. and i do actually have i actually have a chart that that is perfect for what you're talking about so <laughs> within within the airports that we're talking about uh, the airlines that you're probably most familiar with in the U.S. make up the uh, vast minority of flights that go through these uh, airports. So, you know, traveling uh, within Mexico as well as between Mexico and, and Central America, uh, there the, there are there's much more competition and much better pricing. Um, the the only thing where that's not true, I mean, there's a lot of cross border traffic in border towns because a lot of goods, uh, you know, in Mexico are cheaper. Tourism is cheaper. It's definitely cheaper to let's say go to Cabo for a vacation than it is to go to Hawaii or you know something like that. The the one exception to that um, because of you know various uh, tariffs as well as just the 
you know, the, the, uh, the supply chain from China to the U.S., uh, electronics tend to be cheaper in the U.S. So you get you get a situation on the border where people might be crossing the border north uh, for shopping to get, you know, their their new computer or their iPhone or, um, you know, video card or, or video games, all, 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 everything electronics, video games um, uh, tends to be cheaper in, in the U.S. So there, there's a bit of, you know, cross-border arbitrage uh, there as well. But yeah, other than that, uh, it's definitely it's definitely a popular destination because of the, uh, the, the 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 cheaper travel. Arbitrage, contraband, uh, lose, uh, yeah. but uh, hey, no judgment. Uh, buy most of my electronics in Portland, Oregon, and I do believe mm-hmm. uh, if if people mm-hmm. can drive even norther, depending on where they're coming from, Mexico or south to Oregon, I think globally there is no place that sells cheaper electronics than than. Portland state. I'm sure whatever zero sales tax mm-hmm. state in the yep, US. Yep, yeah, no, no sales tax in the state of Oregon. Yep, that's true. Yeah, I mean, even even for simple electronics like you know, cables or adapters or batteries, the you know, the equivalent, even if it's even if it's sold on Amazon Mexico and, and in you know uh, Amazon US, it tends to be cheaper in the US. So I wouldn't have guessed that for batteries, uh, but uh, good to know. Um, but yeah, so, you know, having looked at um, uh, KOF and, and PAC, the, you know, KOF, um, better better dividend than, uh, than Coca-Cola US, uh, strong, you know, last five years, strong growth trends. Um, PAC, they have had some short-term challenges, but I think uh, the most likely scenario is that it ends up being you know relatively immaterial to their future financials and bottom line, um, and and if anything, it's it's uh, it's it's led to some nice uh, short term um, discounts on the on the on the price of the of the business and very strong very strong dividend and a long history of sustaining that dividend. So a couple interesting a couple interesting companies inspired by your by your recent uh, uh, Turkish picks. Uh, well, I wouldn't take that credit. And honestly, you presented PSC a lot before uh, we did TAV. How about we put uh, TAVHL, TAV Airports from Turkey against PSC and see uh, how they did? I haven't done this. Yeah. Uh, I haven't either. Although with the, with the recent performance performance of a lot of your uh, a lot of your um, Turkish picks. a lot of your Turkish picks, it's it's possible that it succeeded. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, last five years. Certainly, you'd have done better off with uh, TAV. I it's gone up so high now. I wonder, uh, moving how the next five years would look like. But having seen what you've seen, and they were comparable for about a decade. They were, yeah, straight comparable. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Having you know different years, but uh having seen both now uh both comparisons between the coca-cola bottler and uh, the airport and having seen the recent uh you know uptick uh, what do you think based on you know what you independently researched and what you heard and so uh how do you feel about i, I let's let's leave geographic risks aside uh sure. we both agree to disagree there uh but uh, besides that, what, what moving? Uh, how do you think the next five ten years would look like? Well, C- CCI certainly has more opportunities for growth given their regional expansion. Um, you know, FEMSA has had g- good growth in in Mexico, but they are a very well established bottler in a in a very mature market for Coca Cola, uh, and so their you know their growth will over time. It's going to look much more like Coca-Cola U.S., and so in terms of in terms of growth, your your CCI pick is probably is probably there. In terms of you know in terms of you know dividend and you know long history of being a good capital allocator, um, you know I think FEMSA, um, Coca-Cola FEMSA is 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 a, is a strong option, but it's you know it's it's going to look more like. Um, going to look more like coca-cola us i think because of the situation with the regulatory environment for airports in mexico that uncertainty has given 
uh, has has depressed PAC in the short term. Um, and so perhaps that will give it a leg up uh, relative to TAV uh, in the future. So I think on these on these head to heads, you know, CCI has a clear runway for for growth uh, in terms of the regional expansion over over Coca-Cola FEMSA. But um, PAC relative to TAV, PAC might get a, a leg up because, you know, a lot of that recent performance delta between PAC and TAV is, is, is the result of PAC's underperformance. Uh, as much as it is uh, a result of TA, TAV's overperformance, um, and assuming those regulatory headwinds go away, which I, which I, I, I suspect they will, um, I think PAC will will bounce back. Um, and you know, uh, same same thing on the dividend with PAC as Femsa Coca Cola. It's got a strong dividend, long history of paying it, uh, good capital out, good capital allocator. So perhaps PAC has a shot against uh, against TAV, but. Uh, Fence Coca Cola probably doesn't have a shot against uh, against CCI, just given that it's such a much more mature market. As two millennials talking about uh, you know airlines that burn a lot of dinosaur fat and the bottlers <laughs> that have a lot of uh, waste, uh, mm -hmm. you know people lean green, but the green they lean to can be different. How do sure. you think about? Uh, ownership or well in um in mexico as it relates to the bottler so femsa coca-cola is in many ways a more green play than coca-cola us um so in in many in many parts of mexico in particular all the large cities you can still um, have coca-cola products delivered to your door um that are that are that are made out of glass and those glass bottles need to be returned to uh the crate when you're done with them so you know, you drink your, uh, you know, you drink your 48 bottles of Coca-Cola. You put the empties back in the in the same in the, in the exact same slot in the rack that it came from. You give the empties to the Coca-Cola uh, delivery folks. They take it back. They wash it. They refill it. And so, in in the big cities with Coca-Cola, there's a very very high percentage of recycling when it comes to uh, the the home delivery piece. There are certainly plastic Coca-Cola bottles in Mexico. Um, but the recycling rates for those bottles in Mexico is, is actually much higher than, than the U.S. So, Femsa Coco, I mean, take it with a grain of, uh, grain of salt because this is uh, uh, this is from Femsa's own report. But but Femsa Coca Cola claims that uh, close to forty percent of all of its plastic Coca Cola bottles in Mexico are actually uh, recycled, and they have uh, they have their own um, uh, RPET recycled um, PET bottle recycler. Um, and so th those rates are are pretty high. On the uh, on the on the on the aeronautical and jet side of things, uh, I don't think there's really much. <laughs> there's there's not really much positive there in terms of a low environmental footprint piece, other than to say that commercial air travel is much better for the planet than private jets. So, you know, next time you see uh, uh, <laughs> all of the. Uh, <laughs> All of the uh, international business leaders at uh, Davos, uh, who traveled there with their private jet, uh, you know, their footprint to get there is much higher than than flying commercial. But, um, but yeah, there's there seems to be no. Uh, there, there's very there's very few uh, there's very few reason to suspect that we will travel by air less uh, in the future. From some a, may argue that those flights are important because how else will they coordinate layoffs? Having said that, right, yes, uh, exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, how how else will they tell the world how polluting they're all being if they uh, don't get on their private jet and travel to Davos? Uh, that is true about them and and uh, the folks who uh, are greenwashing everything uh, or or complaining about enterprises greenwashing everything because um, right. the same demographic that does revenge travel is the same one that that you know pushes uh, green initiatives, uh, which which brings me to another controversial set of picks uh, uh, we will do next time, uh, which is coal. <laughs> uh, uh, oh. <laughs> I truly believe that we should have clean energy. Again, as an individual, I'm carbon negative, uh, but uh, I'm capital. I like to be 
capital positive when it comes to my picks and uh coal happens to be one of them uh i believe energy will be green at some point but uh before it becomes clean it will get a little dirty especially with this whole ai boom and uh, with that context i'll uh, i'll i'll touch on coal next time and we can see what hate if at all we get from all the two <laughs> listeners that <laughs> that listen in quite to with right, that so thank good. you so much uh professor all right this was next time educational bye <laughs> thank you bye.